So for the past several weeks, we've been going through some very basic doctrines, doctrines that we hold to be true in this church, and just doctrines I would consider to be very uh, rudimentary, very fundamental to the faith, and, and things that need to be just, just brought up regularly so that we don't get too messed up in any of our core doctrines. And this morning, what I'm going to be dealing with is actually the issue that kind of prompted my, my decision to just go ahead and start teaching all the basic truths. I'm going to be teaching on the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. This is not some brand new doctrine by any stretch of the imagination. It's been around for a real long time. And it's found, the reason why is because it's found in Scripture. And it's not just in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament as well. But basically, the doctrine of the Trinity, that there are three that are one. There is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We see here in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So the word Trinity does this mean a, a triune God. Three in one unity that makes up God. And that is the concept that I'm going to be teaching this morning. I'm going to look at plenty of evidence through Scripture to teach this. Now, um, this doctrine's been under attack for a very long time as well. And, you know, one of the reasons, and I, and I mentioned this earlier in a different sermon where we, I preached last week on, on all matters of faith and practice, which is we rely on God's word to be the foundation of what we believe. It's not on historical teachings. It's not on church fathers. It's not on what man says. It's on what God's word says. It's on, it's on the Bible. And uh, for those of you who are visiting with us, we are a King James only church, meaning that we only use the King James Version of the Bible in the English language. And the reason why is because there's a lot of different versions of the Bible in English, and they don't all say the same things. And we believe that God's Word has been preserved, that He's preserved His Word throughout time. And the where we can find His Word in the English-speaking world is in the King James Version of the Bible. So I'm not going to go through and, and, you know, and do a whole sermon on that, because I've done many on that. And if you're interested in that topic, we've got a DVD back there about the Bible version. So, so take that with you and bring that home with you. And you can check that out or speak with me after the service. I'm more than happy to talk about that. But one of the reasons I bring that up is because 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, this very, very clear scripture talking about the three in one is removed from virtually every new modern version in the English language. It does not exist. And they go back and say, well, this doesn't exist in the, uh, the, the most reliable Greek transcripts and things like that. So um, this doctrine has been under attack for a very long period of time. Now, we're going to go back and, and reread some of 1 John chapter 5. We're going to start back in verse number 1 because this chapter actually has a lot to do with salvation. There is a lot mentioned here. I mean, I, use, I have these verses. This is my soul winning Bible, and I have these verses highlighted down here because I highlighted in this Bible all the, uh, many of the verses that I use when I go out soul winning to just to highlight to show people real quickly on the page where it is. And... Um, this is a passage I go to, this is a, a, a chapter I go to regularly trying to show people how to be saved. And um, there's, there, because there's so much within this chapter. Look at verse number one, the Bible, there, the chapter here starts off by saying, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So right off the bat, whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, that's how you get saved. That's how you're born again. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's keep reading. The Bible says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Just as a side note, I don't want to do this too much because I got a lot of content to cover, but anytime you see people like overcoming the world, this is being defined as people who are saved, people who have their faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we overcome the world. It's not through our good works. It's not by living a righteous life that's going to allow us to overcome the world. And people have this false uh, doctrine, a false belief of a works-based salvation because they look at a few verses that talk about overcoming the world. It's defined right here in 1 John chapter 5 that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Not our good works, not our righteousness, it's our faith that is the victory that overcomes the world. Verse number 5, 
Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, I'll pause on that just for a second because we already saw in the first verse, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's what we need to believe to be saved, right? Well, we also have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, one of the reasons why I think people are starting to get confused on this doctrine of the Trinity, and I'm not saying everybody is, but there's some confusion going on about this, is because the emphasis for as long as I could remember, as long as I've been going to church, has always been on the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Because that seems to be what people have been pushing the hardest against. That's where you have the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons that do not believe this. And because we believe in door-to-door -door evangelism, we go out and knock on people's doors and try to give them the gospel, what we run into is people who have already spoken with Jehovah's Witnesses, already spoken to Mormons, who do not believe that, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. So therefore, we need to answer that. We need to have a response to that. We need to just, you know, we've been focusing so much on making sure that people understand, hey, Jesus Christ was not just a man. He was God in the flesh. And Amen and amen, that is critical. But the problem is, is when we focus too much just on the one aspect of the Trinity, when it comes to this doctrine of understanding the three in one, we can tend to get a little bit skewed in our understanding of what the, what the Bible's teaching here. And I, I, I'm bringing that up just because I think that's kind of the source of some problems. And I'll be honest with you, even myself, didn't, I didn't have a proper understanding because I didn't think it all the way through because I've always been focused on the deity of Christ and not on what, the, what the, the scripture actually says all throughout the Bible. And we need to make sure that we're always being honest with this. And I'm going to go a lot more in depth tonight because this is, there's way too much to cover in one sermon or even two sermons on this subject because there's so much scripture on this. Tonight, I'm, today, this morning, I'm going to be covering just the basic concept and the doctrine we can see from scripture. Tonight, I'm going to be answering a little bit more of the difficult, uh, you know, quote-unquote difficult verses that people will object to and try to teach a different doctrine, which is called oneness or modalism, where people believe that Jesus Christ is the Father, where, where that, that separation is gone, where, where it's just this whole mix mash into one um, one person or one entity. Now, um, I don't want to get too far into that because, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna deal, I have a whole sermon already prepared for tonight dealing with that subject. Um, so verse number five here, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So we have to believe Jesus is a Christ. We also have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's th this Trinity doctrine is so important because not only does it help us understand God and the essence of God, who God is, but it's an element of salvation and believing of Jesus Christ. You literally have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So just, it, just by virtue of him being a son makes him different from the Father, right? I mean, it, by having a father and a son, there, there is just inherently a, a, a significant difference there. You, you wouldn't just say that you just have to believe that, because nowhere in the Bible you're going to find that you have to believe that Jesus is the Father. Nowhere you're going to find. I mean, all if you read the whole New Testament, you're going to see the Son of God, the Son of God, the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Trinity is vital, this, this concept, this understanding of God and who he is. And like I said, we focus so much on Jesus because Jesus is the Son of God that also makes him God. And we're going to get to that. That's, that's in my notes here. There's the scripture reference for that. But um, I want to just kind of take a step back and make sure we completely understand the Godhead as it's referred to in the Bible. Let's keep reading here in 1 John chapter 5. Verse number 6 reads, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now there's a fundamental foundational truth that's found throughout the Bible that is part of just justice, it's part of God's law, it's part of truth in general, and that's the importance of having more than one witness in order to establish the truth. 
In order to understand what is right or what is wrong, God requires there to be more than one witness, which is why in 1 John 5, 7, he's even bringing up this point that there are three that bear record in heaven. There's three. There's not just one. If you want to find someone who's bearing record or bearing a witness, the Bible is explaining here, no, you need more than one to bear record. And in heaven, there's actually three that are bearing record. Now, in order for a witness to be counted as, as you know, in order to have multiple witnesses, you have to have multiple witnesses. I know it sounds silly, but if Jesus Christ is the Father and Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost, like if, if they're all just one person, then you don't have three witnesses. Now, the three witnesses are one because there's one God. And let me just explain it this way. I'm going to get into this a little bit further as well, but the, the best way to understand this, I believe, or an easy way to understand this. Now, every illustration or example falls short at some point, especially when we're describing God, whose being, whose essence is so far above us and you know, eternal, omnipresent, um, omniscient, every, you know, all these things that God is. When we're using, say, a human being as an example, an illustration of God, it's going to fall short. But our bodies, who we are, we are comprised in three parts. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. But there's one person here. There's one of us, right? We, it makes up one human being. But you have all three aspects, and all three aspects are different from each other. Our soul is not our spirit. Our spirit is not our flesh. You know, our flesh is not our soul. They're different from each other. But they coexist equally with each other and are one. Now, I'm going to get into that illustration a little bit better. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there, though, to help right off the bat to get the doctrine that I'm trying to express here, that is the Trinity, the three in one, the three aspects or persons of God, if you will, that is found in one. But what we see in 1 John 5, 7, uh, turn, if you would, to uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, because we're going to see this quite a bit. This, just the concept of having more than one witness in order to establish truth. All the way back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 19.15, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. So in God's law, if someone's going to accuse someone of sinning, if someone's going to accuse someone of breaking the law, he says, well, you have to have two or three witnesses in order for the whole matter to be established in order to know what's going on here, in order to establish what really happened. You need two or three witnesses. Matthew 18, 16 says, Jesus Christ said, but if he, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And that was in reference to some church discipline or some church problems. When people have a problem with each other in church and you go to them personally and, they, you know, and they're not, you're not getting along still, you have some conflict, he says, okay, your next step is to take two or three people along with you and you can, you can argue it out and talk about it and discuss your problem. And that way, everything that this person says and the other person says, hey, every word's going to be established because you're going to have witnesses there to establish, yep, this is what you said. Yep, this is what he said to establish all the facts and to get to the truth of the matter. You have two or three witnesses. I had you turn to John chapter number eight. John chapter number eight, look at verse number 13. John 8, 13, the Bible says, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. See, the Pharisees understood this about the law, that you need a couple witnesses. So that's why they're talking to Jesus and saying, Hey, you're just bearing witness of yourself. That witness isn't true. You need more than one witness. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and where I go. So basically Jesus answers them. We're going to get to the rest of the verse in a minute. He says, look, even though I'm bearing record of myself, it's still true. He's like, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going to. Now, obviously you can say something that's true without having witnesses. Like it could still be truth. But the witnesses establish the matter. The witnesses are saying, oh, yep, no, that's true, that's true, that's true. So he starts off just by saying, look, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going to, so I'm speaking the truth. But then he goes on, he says, verse 15, you judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. There's a duality there. 
He said, it's not just me. I'm not alone. I'm not all by myself. If, he was if, he, if Jesus Christ literally just was the Father, he would be by himself. But he says, no, I and the Father that sent me. Verse 17, it is, al it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. He's using this, this doctrine, this understanding of witnesses and separating himself from God the Father because there is a separation there even though they are one. It's, 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 a, it's a concept here that we have to look to Scripture to understand. Look at, turn to John chapter number 5. It's, it's going to be a similar thing that he states here in John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5, and we're going to start reading in verse number 31. Verse 31 of John chapter 5, the Bible reads, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And this is going to be talking about John the Baptist. He says, Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. So even though John bear witness of him, he's saying, I have an even better, I have a greater witness than John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. So he's saying, the works that I'm doing, the miracles I'm performing in itself is a witness that he's from God and that the word that he's saying is truth. That's what he's explaining in this passage here. But look at verse number 37. He says, and the Father himself. Now, I'm going to get into this in just a minute, but people have a problem of using the word three persons. We believe that there's three persons in one God. Well, himself is a reference to a person. It's a pronoun being used for another person. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And this is, I'm going to go into this a lot more tonight. I don't remember if I actually have this in my notes, so I just want to make mention of it right here briefly. Jesus says, Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Talking about God the Father. There's another verse where Jesus said, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's where people want to say, see, Jesus Christ is the Father because of that verse. He said, I'm going to go into that tonight. But we can see right here, that it, because people are misunderstanding that passage. Right here he says, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. You haven't seen the Father. You haven't seen his shape. You haven't heard his voice. Because they've heard the voice of Jesus and they've seen Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh, but he's God the Son. He's one part of that Godhead. And he says, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Now, I don't believe there's any contradiction in scriptures, but I'm going to go into that much further detail tonight, so make sure not to miss tonight if you want to hear the rest of that. Now, obviously, there's definitely three witnesses in the Godhead. And the idea or notion of there being three persons within the Godhead is accurate. Because we see that there's witnesses. It's a Bible word. It's a Bible definition being used as a witness. Well, persons is basically going to be the same thing. And as I mentioned before, you know, we spend so much time proving the deity of Christ to fight the cults, but not enough time showing the distinctions and the threeness of the Godhead. Because when you focus so much on Jesus being God, it, it kind of forces you into this, into a, into a, a distorted perspective of the Godhead. The fact that there are three is found way more often in Scripture. Um, you're in John 5, right? Let's stay in John 5. We're going to jump back up now to verse number 16. And you'll find this to be true. Anyone who's on if you've read the Bible, especially the New Testament, if you've read the New Testament um, at all, you'll know that what I'm saying is true because we're always seeing references to Jesus Christ, the Son, and God the Father, and, and, and just the total separation between the two. It, it's, it's all throughout Scripture, but even in this one chapter, we'll just read through this a little bit, starting in verse number 16. The Bible says, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. 
Okay, I'm showing a difference there. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, this is, this is also a true statement. They, they got mad at him for, I want to say the right reasons, but they understood that when he said he was the son of God, that makes him God also by inheritance, by virtue of being his son, makes him uh, um, equal with God. So, but they didn't believe that and they hated him for it, right? They thought that that was blasphemy, but it was true. He was, he was Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He was born of God and he was God. Now, um, verse number 19 says, then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Again, the Father is showing the Son. The Father is saying, hey, I'm doing these works. You look at these works. You do these works. This is the way Jesus Christ is explaining the relationship between the Father and himself. You have to have the separation of the three to, to some degree, right? Now, they're not completely different um, just gods, right? We don't believe in three gods. It's not polytheistic because there's still one God. But there are definitely three aspects of God or three persons that make up that one God here. Now, the Bible says here in verse number uh, 23, we're going to keep reading this because this chapter is just so full of this concept and this understanding. Or verse number 22, excuse me. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now again, there, in order for there not to be any contradiction in Scripture, God doesn't want, you know, in the Ten Commandments, he said not to have any other gods before him, right? Yet Jesus is saying, hey, you need to honor me as much as you honor the Father. Well, Jesus isn't another God. He's not a separate God. He's not some God you're putting before the Father because he is God. But just as much as the Father is God, Jesus is God. But he's a, different, he's a different person within the Godhead. So, um, and he's, he's explaining this truth to them. Verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself himself, to himself there, two persons, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And this is critical, again, to understanding the different personhood of God, that they're, they're the three persons, because Jesus Christ himself said, it's not my own will. Your will is what you want to do. It's your desire. It's your wish. That's what a will is. So he's saying, it's not my will, but it's the will of the Father, indicating that you can have a separation of wills within the Godhead. Now, again, another illustration to, to give us a, a good understanding of this is, wait a minute, because God's not schizophrenic in the sense that he has just total multi-personalities of wanting to do different things. You know, one of them wants to go kill people. One of them, wants, you know, that's not it at all. They're all in unity. Now, we, as I mentioned before, we have a, a three-part person ourselves, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, right now, one way to understand this is that our spirit, when you're born again, and your spirit is born again, the Bible says that the spirit is born of God. 
And the Spirit does not commit sin. The Spirit is what drives us into doing right. The Spirit will always want to do what is good and righteous in God's eye. But the flesh is what makes us want to sin, makes us want to disobey God. So we have, in a sense, a dichotomy within ourselves where the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in that regard, we could comprehend, well, I can see how there can be different wills. Now, the wills within our body between the flesh and the spirit are contradictory to each other. God's different, you know, the, the three personhoods are not contradictory. They're all in unity. They're all, so ultimately when this flesh dies in our own bodies, we will have a new glorified body that will not be sinful. And then we will no longer have this struggle of one will of the flesh versus one will of the spirit. Does that make sense? And that, you know, I'll prove that from scripture. That was kind of the last of my notes here. But I'm going to just read the passage for you. Stay, if you would, in John, because we're going to spend a little bit more time in John. But in Romans chapter number 7, if you want to just make note of this, you can look at it later. This describes exactly what I was just teaching. Romans 7 verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would... That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Now, it's a little bit of, of confusing language when you, when you kind of hear it. Um, but when you, when you take the time and look at it and think about it, what he's saying is that the things that I do, I don't want to do. He said, I allow not. That which I do, I allow not. I end up doing things I don't want to do. Now, isn't this true of everybody? Aren't there things that, that you have? You have values, you have morals, and sometimes you just end up doing things that you don't really want to do. And he says, uh, for that I would, the things I want to do, the things I really want to do, oh man, I really want to serve God, I really want to be reading my Bible, I really want to be doing all this stuff. He says, I end up not doing those things. So he's, he's explaining what's going on within himself. Verse 16 says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I have a will. He says, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's delightful. God's law. Yes, the law is good. I delight after God's law, after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It's very clearly laid out in Scripture that we have this dichotomy. And anyone understands that who's born again living today because we still have this flesh. But this is how you can maybe help to understand the concept. How can Jesus Christ have one will and God have a different will? Now, because they are God, their will, and, and because they're sinless and all the attributes of God are assigned to each part of the Godhead. They have all the same, because there is one God. But there is a difference of will, but the wills are still in unity with each other. Jesus Christ never committed sin while he was on this earth. Why? Because his will was still in unity with God. But here we see him saying, well, I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father. And which also means we show a, a, a submission to the Father as well, as far as who's giving the direction and, and, the, and the focus within the Godhead. Another example of, of, of a difference of will, I'll just read these for you. Luke twenty two forty two 42 says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This is when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's just one reference of it. There's, all the other Gospels have the same exact reference of him praying to God in the Garden. 
praying to the Father, the Son praying to the Father, saying, you know what? I don't want to go through with this, you know, being crucified on the cross and everything. If there's another way that I can be the Savior of the world, if there's another way that we can do this, I'd rather do that. Because he's facing something. But, but see, he still says, but not my will, but thine be done. I'm still here to be a servant. I'm still here to do what it takes. If there's another way, I'd rather do that. But I'm still going to go forward and do what you have me to do. See, and that's how Jesus Christ could still have been without sin because he was still doing the will. He was just trying to find any other way around it. And that, that was that slight difference of will there. He's saying, well, I'm not going to do according to my will, but thine be done. Uh, John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. We see this in multiple places. If you have a difference of wills, you have a difference of persons. These verses cannot make sense unless Jesus and the Father are separate persons within the Godhead. Now we know that God is definitely one. So how could there be three in one, three wills? Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 1 Corinthians 8.6, But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Ephesians 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The fact that there's one God is very consistent throughout Scripture as well. And this is where I think some people get a little bit confused just because, well, wait a minute, is there one God? Is there three? You know, what's the deal here? Well, there's one God. There is one supreme being, one entity that is called God. That, that, and God basically is kind of a general term. It's the most generic term for God. And God is a concept that everybody uh, across all cultures and religions kind of have an understanding of, right? As much as we can being human beings. You know, it's hard to comprehend eternity. It's hard to comprehend things never having existed physically here. It's hard to comprehend not having a start point but see, God is outside of everything because he created everything. So it, it, it's, it's a little hard to grasp the concept of God in general. Just, just the fact that there is a God that created everything. He doesn't have a start date. He always was. There was a time before earth and everything else existed. And it was just God. Because there was nothing else. So these are concepts that could be hard to grasp. But we all have somewhat of a semblance of what this is. So there is one God. One creator, if you will, one supreme being that, that has the omnipresence, the omnipotence, knowing everything, right? The um, all-powerful, um, uh, um, you know, omniscient, um, omnipresent, and omnipotent. So all of these things are attributes of God. Now, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And all three persons of the Godhead have those qualities of God because there's one God. So when you hear the general term God, and this is, this is going to be important too when you do your reading because this actually, a lot of the events that came up recently, and if you're not familiar with them, it's not that big of a deal, but um, it really caused me to, to read, and that's why I've waited to preach this sermon a little bit, because in my own reading and understanding of the Bible, um, we want to look at all the words very carefully so that we're not getting confused or screwed up on, on any doctrine. And even things that you kind of feel like um, it's easy to gloss over. Be reading very carefully what all the words say and what they mean. And um, understanding God and who He is and how the Trinity works um, when you look at the different terms used to describe God or identify God, um, God, when God is used, it could be used specifically for one aspect of the Godhead as well as all three combined. 
It, it's, it's, it's a usage that uh, is determined by the context of the word. But God, the fact that God exists as a Godhead, that's why I show this in Romans chapter 1 before we move on from this point. Romans chapter 1, verse 19, the Bible says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without ex excuse. Excuse me. Romans 1 there in that passage is talking about people, his creation, God's created beings, us as individuals, are without excuse to, to know who God is. Because he's saying that the invisible things of God, in verse 20, from the creation of the world, they're clearly seen. He's showing us who he is even through his own creation. He's, he's, he's manifesting himself to us. He says, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God head. The fact that there's a God head consisting of, of three parts is found even within nature, even within his creation. Things like, um, you know, there's so many things that exist in threes. You have time, space, and matter. You have water, which is another illustration I like to use when I go out and preach the gospel to people and get them to understand this concept of the Trinity. Water can be found as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Or you have ice, water, and steam. But it's still all H2O. It's, that's the, the composite, what makes up water. The essence of water, H2O, is all the same in those three forms. And that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an illustration. Again, it falls apart at some level when you're describing God. But God has an essence of, of who, you know, who God is, that being. And there's the three manifestations, there's the three aspects of God, like the solid, liquid, and the gas. It's, ma it's demonstrated to us in that sense. Or like an egg, right? You have, if you have an egg, you have an a egg white, an egg yolk, and an egg shell. There's three parts of that egg, but there's one egg, right? There's, there's one thing called water, but it exists in three different states. There's one, um, you know, and, and again, with our body, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, each part of these is not the other part. They are separate and distinct from each other, but they make up a whole. They make up one whole thing. The body's not the soul. All three comprise the human. There are attributes that are common to God that make up one God. These attributes are shared by the three, but don't let shared attributes confuse you into making each member identical. Just as much as you don't want to make the three aspects be confused into making them completely separate either uh, and, and not having a unity, not, having, not being one God. We're almost, let's see. Well, I'm doing pretty good on time. Actually, a lot better than I thought I'd be doing at this point. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Because there's definitely three persons within the Godhead. And this is, this is a term that I don't shy away from at all. I've heard some people not like using this concept, but... We've already demonstrated that there's three will, or there's, there's wills that are different, right? We saw the wills that are different between the Father and the Son can have different wills. We're going to even see the word person being used to identify the different parts, persons within the Godhead. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible reads, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, wait, of whose person? The Father's person. Right? Jesus Christ is the image, the express image of the Father's person. That's why I make note of that. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10. I'll just read this for you. It says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also, for if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. So now we see Christ having a person. The Bible using the word person to describe Jesus. 
You have the person of the Father. You have the person of the Son. Now, the Bible doesn't call the Holy Ghost a person, but, I mean, it would follow through that you have three persons when you have three in one. Okay, I, I could, there's not a specific verse like there are for these two that say that there's a person. And having three, it, it, it just exemplifies the, 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 the serious distinctions between the three aspects of the Godhead while still having one God. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And then after that, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to get ahead. John chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know we're going through a lot of scripture tonight, or this morning, excuse me, but it's, it's important. I mean, as I taught last week, everything that we believe should be based on what the Bible says. So hopefully we'll be taking notes and, and paying attention to these and looking them up later. See if what I'm teaching is, is accurate, if it's true, if it, if it follows along with the rest of Scripture. But um, there, there's just so much here. So, and that's why I have the, the, to divide my sermon up into basically two parts. Because there's so much, there's so much Scripture to deal with. It's, it's all throughout Scripture. So hopefully you're seeing what I'm trying to teach this morning. John chapter 14, verse number 28. The Bible says, and this is Jesus Christ speaking, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So we're starting to see here now also a chain of command or authority structure within the Godhead. Because Jesus Christ said, My Father is greater than I, in verse 28. He said, He's greater than me. He also said in verse 31, As the Father gave me commandment, the Father commanded the Son. He's saying, that's what I'm doing. The Father is the, the head of the Godhead, if you will. The Father is the one making up these rules. I had you turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read for you from John 20. John 20, verse 17 says, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to, the, to my Father. But go to my brother and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. That was Jesus Christ talking about the Father being his God. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 23. The Bible says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. And this is talking about the, the, the resurrections. There's three resurrections, okay, just to get you in the, con in the context of what we're talking about here. Christ the first fruits, for Christ was the first one risen from the dead. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, when Jesus Christ comes back in, there's going to be another resurrection. That's the rapture. And then cometh the end. Look at this. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. This is talking about after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ comes back, there's a rapture. God pours out his wrath. Then there's a millennial kingdom set up. For a thousand years, Jesus Christ is going to be literally ruling and reigning on this earth, and he's going to have all power. He will be at the top of the structure within the Godhead. He will be the one in charge of the three that make up the Trinity. But then after those thousand years are over, it says that he's going to deliver up the kingdom back to God, the Father. It's going to go back to, because the Father is in charge right now, Jesus is going to come and reign, and then it's going to go back. The authority is going to be placed back with the Father. He shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 
You can't get much clearer than that as far as, you know, to say he was subject, it means he was put under the authority of the Father. So, and none of this is blasphemous. This is God's word. This is understanding who God is, understanding the, at the different aspects of the Trinity, that they really are distinct and very significantly distinct while being one God at the same time. It's amazing. In this sermon, I'm focusing a lot more on the differences because almost every time I preach on this in the past, I'm always focusing on Jesus Christ being the deity. And that's my fault for not explaining thoroughly in the years that I've been pastoring. But it does need to be expressed completely that just as much as Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and that we worship and serve Jesus Christ, who is the deity, he is God. He is still one aspect of the Godhead, that, there's, that, that he is the Son, there is a Father, and there is a Holy Spirit. These three are one. Now, when understanding the Trinity, and I alluded to this earlier, within Scripture, context is always key. I mean, just like it is with anything you're studying out, get the context of what is being spoken about here. God consists of three parts. However, sometimes you're going to see the word God used and it's only referring to one of the three, and at other times it's used to all three. So you just you, you got to try to figure out. And um, this was something that I've been doing recently, just reading the Bible and say, oh, I see that a lot more clearly now. Going into it, think you know, being co conscious of this, thinking, well, wait, who's speaking here? Is it God, the the Trinity, or is it God of one of the Father? You know, um, and the Lord is the same way. In the Old Testament, you see the Lord in all caps. That's Jehovah. I believe that the Lord is the Trinity or can be the name of the Trinity as well as speaking of just one aspect of the Godhead. So look out for that in your reading as well. But again, you, the only way you're going to determine that is based on the context. How, is the, how are things being um, expressed in the scripture? And because God exists in three parts as one God, each member of the Trinity can speak either representing their own like part of the Godhead or representing the entire Godhead. Jesus can speak as God, as the Trinity, or he can speak as himself when he was saying like, you know, not my will but thine be done. He also has the power and the authority because he's God to speak with all of them. As, as, as all three members. Now, um, Genesis chapter 1, we'll see, we'll see uh, an example of this. Not with Jesus, but the concept, right? So I'm trying to drive this concept home. And we're, we're, we're almost done. We're almost done. So just stick with me here and just try to, try to get this last point. Because oftentimes people will fall into different false doctrines because they don't understand things properly, um, just, just in general. And, and this is a good example. In Genesis chapter 1, you're going to see different usages of pronouns referring to God. So you're going to see a pronoun in the singular and pronoun in the plural. Both are accurate because there's one God, but God consists of three parts. So if, if, if he's speaking in reference to all three, that's plural. If you're speaking as one God, then that's singular. And, and Genesis 1 illustrates this example. Verse number 26, the Bible says, And God said, right? So again, God is just a generic term. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the cre every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God, again, the generic term, created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So he first he says, let us make man. And then it says, he made man in his image. So there's, a, there's the plural and the singular. And where some people get this wrong is they see, well, let us, and they'll say, well, this must be talking about God and the angels and God or some other created beings. But the Bible doesn't say that we're created in the image of angels. Right. 
That's where that falls short. But it's just this lack of comprehension or understanding when you use the plural pronoun here. Well, how can this be saying us? Because it's God. Because God is three in one. There is a trinity there, and that's why it's perfectly acceptable and fine to use a plural pronoun in reference to God as well as a singular pronoun in reference to God. So um, Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Ghost is God. But Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Holy Ghost, and the Father is not the Holy Ghost. They are three distinct. They are three witnesses, but they are one God. One other place where people get screwed up with this, and this is the last point, but is, is um, this will be my last example on this. I'm going to go into a lot more tonight. But when Jesus died on the cross, right, if you remember that, he said to the thief on the cross, he says, today shalt thou be with me in paradise, Right? Now, the Bible records in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell for three days and three nights. He bare the sins of the whole world. He died on that cross. The Bible says his soul was in hell. So what happens is, is without having a proper understanding of the Trinity and Jesus being able to speak as God the Trinity, they come up with a, a, a weird doctrine saying, well, paradise is in the heart of the earth. No normal understanding of the word. I mean, paradise is used, I think, only three times in the Bible. But when you look at paradise, paradise is talking about heaven. I mean, we know what paradise is, right? It's not, it's not something that, it's, it's not a place that's surrounded by fire and brimstone. Right. Hell is the place that is fire and brimstone. And that's where Jesus went for three days and three nights because he bare the sins of the whole world. Because he literally paid for our sins when he died on the cross. But then he rose again from the dead, having the keys of death and of hell. Because that's where he went. I mean, the scripture is clear about that. But people then don't understand this and say, well, wait a minute. How can he say you're going to be with me? Because he is God and part of the Trinity and God the Father is in heaven and the Holy Spirit. So he was with God the Father. He was with the Holy Spirit. He was with him in the sense that he's God. It's, it's not that hard to, to, to understand, to, you know, to figure out, but we need to be careful about this. And, and you know, when, we, when, we're, when we're looking at these statements and we're considering that there are three in one to, to make sure that our doctrine is always clear and true and that's not contradicting anything else in Scripture. Because when you start finding the contradictions, then you know you're on the wrong path. Let's, uh, but let's bow our heads and, and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the, um, all the truth found in your word. God, I, I pray that you would please help our, our human minds to comprehend this subject. And Lord, it, it, it really isn't too extremely complicated. You've given us so many examples to help us to understand the essence of, of who you are. And... Um, Lord, it truly is amazing, and, and we thank you for sharing so much of yourself to us and helping us to know who you are. Lord, I pray that, that um, you would just help open up our hearts and our minds to your words and that you would lead us in all truth and wisdom, dear Lord. And I pray that you please bless the soul in time this afternoon. Help us to lead many people to your Son, Jesus Christ, that they might believe on him and receive the gift of eternal life. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.